Hi, uh, my name is Lenore von Stein, and this is another episode of The Facts. Uh, this is a discussion episode. The Facts is usually is, is, is music, some of you who tune in. Uh, but we are also integrating episodes of discussion uh, for my brain and your brain, you know, for get these people talking, other people talking about stuff. And tonight we're, we're going to continue uh, talking about education. And with me tonight is uh, Bill Crane, who's at City College, and he's a professor of psychology and works in child development. And we have Lois Weiner. Uh, she's at New Jersey City University in elementary and sec professor of elementary and secondary education. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And we have Alan Fagenberg, <laughs> whose name I mispronounce all the time. Uh, he's at City College, and he's in architecture and education. And we've been sitting here for a while talking, um, and these guys have been uh, talking about a lot of different things. But I I'm going to, uh, I'd like to talk tonight uh, about tests and, and teachers, uh, attitudes towards teachers, um, what we call the deprofessionalizing of teachers. What is a profession, any profession? What do you think a profession is? Well, I, I'd rather talk about teaching as a profession, because uh, that's really the area of my expertise. And um, I think that when we talk about teaching as a profession, we're talking about an occupation that um, has a moral mooring, um, an occupation that requires mastery of skills and knowledge, and um, an occupation that is driven by a desire to improve the society. So when we talk about the, de the deprofessionalizing of teaching of, uh, as an occupation, I think that we're really talking about an attack on all of those things, on all of those aspects of the occupation. The moral grounding of teaching, I think, is being uh, attacked. The skills and the knowledge, the mastery of a wide range of uh, teaching skills and strategies, knowledge of child development, uh, and understanding of the role of schools in a democracy. I think all of those are, um, are being undercut by the reforms that are being um, uh, imposed on I, kids and I, teachers. I, I, I want to. Why is it so easy to do that in, in this society? It's very easy to attack those morals. And I, I, I do agree with you, uh, the, the acquiring of skills and knowledge. And it's a piece of cake, it seems, to, mm -hmm. um, to knock them around. Um, and, uh, and people have such, uh, seem to have such mixed feelings about teachers. Uh, and, and that's easily played on. I'm not. I, I just, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, um, anybody have anything to yeah, say? Yeah, well, I would add one thing because I agree with you. I think the other thing that's necessary in teaching and educating is a passion, mm -hmm. and I think the passion is to work with younger people and to incorporate in them a quest for questioning and for challenging. And I agree with you. I mean, the 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 kind of the epitome of this is the online courses where now we can even get rid of teachers. Mm -hmm. We can do a tape. And we can do a course, and it doesn't matter whether we have a room, a seminar room with eight students, or we could show it nationally to four million people. And the idea that this undermines what we're trying to do, that anybody can do this. You put it on tape and it can be done. And I think that one of the things, you know, you mentioned it, we see also is these attacks now, it's it happening everywhere, but especially in New York, with what's the problem with education? That first problem is teachers. Why? Because mm -hmm. they're unionized. And we can't get rid of them. And you have lousy people, and we can't get rid of them. And that this is, rather than looking at the basis of education and learning and this narrow, narrow realm we're getting into, it's kind of easy to point the blame and avoid the discussion. Right. One of the things about a professional is that the society trusts the judgment of that person. There's mm -hmm. some basis for the judgment. And the teacher, traditionally as a professional, would make judgments about a, a child. The teacher's observations, intuitions, and so on, made a lot, made a big difference. That they, this child seems sensitive. I'm going to have to be more sensitive to this child. This child is passionate about this, so I'm going to sport, so I'm going to go with that. I think, it, or, or, or in the ability to create, innovate new things. So like a doctor, you expect they will, ha you know, you have to trust the doctor's judgment. And 
Um, judgment about the qualities and individuality of a child and, and the when to back off, when to get tougher on the child, all these things are uh, they go into the, the more the artistic side and they're not very quantifiable. So that um, to make something teacher proof is to have a rigid system and have and, and have a, uh, tests which are simply quantifiable. Right now the teacher's judgment means nothing. They, they don't even, the teachers, the one line uh, Debbie Meyer said is that the teachers have to wait till the test scores come in uh, to know how, what, how the child is reading. Well they don't but they don't. They know how child, well a child's reading mm -hmm. in, in great detail, much more than a, a test will tell them. But, but with the test that deprofessionalizes the, this, the, uh, the profession in that way, the teacher in that way. And uh, part, I think part of the reason, uh, Lenore, is that the, um, this, quantific, this emphasis on whatever is quantifiable in our society, the judgment is that it's, quali it's qualitative. Uh, gets uh, subverted. The, uh, the other thing you were mentioning as we were talking is about the, um, historically the, the teachers with a line, it was an opening for immigrants and women, and uh, mostly women went into it, and it was easy, and you mentioned the gender, and, and these issues made it easy to, and they had to fight to get some status, is that uh, something we were talking about? And so it's easier to take a, you know, a, a profession that basically started off with very low salaries, was assigned to women primarily. Mm -hmm. The school marm was the, the model. It's easier to uh, undermine it. But that's a, maybe that's a different issue than the... Well, I, th I think that um, in, in order to understand the viciousness of this attack, yeah. I mean, because we, it, the, the attack is really like, um, you know, I teach in New Jersey and the governor, Governor Christie's oh, attacks yeah. are, they're personally vicious. There's a, there's a, a malice. Mm -hmm you know, that's uh, um, evident in his yeah. in, in anti-teacher statements, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of global anti-teacher sentiment that's, I think, quite fascinating from a, uh, a, a, <laughs> a, a psychological point of view about what's animating this, this mm -hmm. personal viciousness towards teachers. And I think that, that uh, one aspect that has not been discussed is the fact that teaching is women's work. And 85% uh, of the people who teach in K-12 are women. Mm -hmm. And women are the target. And I don't think that this is really any different from, in, in one respect, from the attack on welfare mm -hmm. and welfare mothers. Mm -hmm. That it is, it is an attack on nurturing. Mm -hmm. And it is an attack on the nurturing functions of a society. And it's part of this whole ethos that the only thing that counts is making money, which is, of course, very easy to quantify. Right. How do you quantify the love and the nurturing that a parent or a teacher or a nurse or a doctor provides? Well, that's hard to do, but what you can do is you can count the money. You can count the dollars. Yeah. So I think that we need to understand this cultural shift in the society. And um, one of the... Um, uh, one of the uh, holes in, I think, um, research that, that's been analyzing this attack on teachers and teaching uh, and teachers' unions is this element of gender. Um, and I think that we really cannot understand the ferocity of the attack or the buy-in without uh, unpacking some of the aspects of, uh, of gender. I want to say one other thing uh, as well. I don't think that the um, I don't think that we can look at the picture in this country and generalize from this country to what's happened in the rest of the world. And the research that I've been doing in the last several years has been about the global context, because these attacks on teachers are global. They are. Um, they're absolutely global. The project began actually under Pinochet. That's right, that's right. Began under Pinochet, and I was just talking to a researcher whose work is on Chile, and she told me that they've uncovered in the archives the fact that the second, the day after Allende fell, they closed down all the schools of teacher education. They had the project all mapped out. They understood that to transform the society, they had to destroy the real existing institutions of teacher education and, pu and public education. So 
It began in, uh, with Pinochet. It then goes to the rest of La Latin America, of course, with the support of the U.S. and the World Bank. It's imposed on Africa and Asia uh, as the price, as part of the restructuring of their economies. In other words, you want money to, uh, to build new roads? You want money to build a dam? Well, you have to alter your school system. You have to use standardized tests. You have to charge fees. Um, you have to limit access to higher education. Um, it spreads to Western Europe with Thatcher. The rest of it goes to Eastern Europe, and then it comes back to the United States in the form of No Child Left Behind in the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. So, But when you look elsewhere in the world, you see tremendous resistance on the part of teachers. Tremendous, and I hope that people will look at this website that is maintained by the um, co-editor of this book I, um, um, I had a part in putting out a few years ago, The Global Assault on Teaching Teachers and Their Unions. The website is www.teachersolidarity.com. You know, the, um, there's one little angle that's fascinated me about this is that the, in, in traditional culture, the teacher, uh, to be a teacher is like the wisest, is the most noble yes. thing that you can, yes. you can be, to, and you see it in African American communities too, when somebody yes. is making some points and, and, and giving a speech or something, they'll, they'll, the, the, the audience will shout out, teach, teach, like it's yes. revered, um, there's something maybe an attack on the intellect, you know, there's a suspicion of the intellectuals or the yeah. people, uh, it, that, because there is, it's yes, it is, and it, it is an it's ideological. It's not just an economic, but it's an ideological. Who, they don't want people to think, to think, think critically, think. and yeah, they so. don't want people. And and you know, when I talk about this, people will say, "Oh, you know, you're saying it's, it sounds like it's a conspiracy." Well, conspiracy is very <laughs> secret, and this isn't secret. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not secret. You you need only to look at the World Bank documents that describe this project that called teachers the greatest threat to global prosperity, teachers and their unions. Oh my God. World Development Report, 2002. So it could be so, uh, it's an laid on out criticism. there. It's just laid out there. When Rod Page said the NEA is a terrorist organization, I don't know if you remember that. Yes. People laughed. They said, oh, what was he smoking? Well, it's not that he was smoking something. He was inhaling the atmosphere <laughs> and the ideas no, very interesting. of the World Bank and Wolfowitz and Paul Wolfowitz. I mean, this, this, these ideas have been just That's interesting. Have permeated the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund for two decades, and we in the United States have just now, it's like it's, it's ricocheted back to us, and we are now just experiencing it. So we should not assume that our, um, the uh, abject surrender of the U.S. teachers' unions characterizes the response in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that I wanted to, I just want to throw this in, because after I said it, I realized that I, I hadn't said enough. Just to, when I said the attitudes towards teachers that, you know, such easy marks. Um, and aside from, you know, traditional gender issues and nurturing issues, I think that part of the reason that I, that I, that I, how I gleaned that attitude is off the mainstream corporate press, you know, exactly. which, which is, you know, giving me the feedback on what's what, you know, I don't, you know, and, and, and everybody else, you know, we're, uh, and uh, so I just wanted to throw that in, you know, that my, my perceptions are, are colored by people who have uh, uh, an agenda. Well, it's a propaganda machine, and, and we really have to acknowledge that this is a, an extremely well-orchestrated, magnificently funded propaganda uh, campaign to make us think that we have no alternative except standardized testing, loss of public ownership of public schools, which is in New York City, characterized by mayoral control. Yeah. Um, creation of charter schools, privatization of public education, all aspects of public education, 
um, are, you have been privatized, and the destruction of teachers' unions. And we need to understand mm -hmm. that the reason that, and it's, they're quite explicit, the reason when you look at, the, at, these, uh, um, at our opponents' literature, to use that word, I'm sorry, but when you look at what they write, they are quite explicit that you have to do away from t with teachers' unions because they are the greatest impediment to carrying out this project. They intend to privatize, corporatize, destroy public ownership. That's the, that's the project. I think it goes, again, I'm in agreement. I think there are all kinds of levels where this also reflects. I mean, it's a big campaign of Teach for America. So it deprofessionalizes teaching because, oh, we can take anybody and send them into a school to teach. And if they only do it for two years, well, that's okay. We'll get some more. <laughs> and the attack on the neighborhoods, I mean, Paulo Freire, when he first became the director of education, he was thrown in jail because he was teaching the peasants to read and write. And it was seen as subversive because if you get people to think, mm -hmm. they're going to question everything uh, that's around them. And I think the, the other aspect of this is that the need where we're having major economic and social problems around the world, but in this country, and who do you find as scapegoats? So you don't pick on Wall Street or the CEOs that are making the biggest bonuses ever in history. So you pick off the more vulnerable. Well, mm -hmm. why are we having problems? Well, our kids are poorly educated. Well, right. right? And if you start looking, they'll show all the statistics. The schools of the United States are slipping further and further down the list right. on any international standards. And instead of looking at this, what do they want to do? They want to get rid of the unions. They want to standardize. They want longer. Schools aren't good, so we'll give even more time in schools. Standardized testing isn't working, so we'll give even more standardized testing. And I think that whole thing is falling into an, an, an e yeah, propaganda it is, but it's an easy out to get people's disillusionment and to help channel it into what I think is the wrong way of going. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think it's, I think it's, a, I, it, it is, I think we need to understand that when Obama appointed Geithner, he was actually also choosing his education policy. Because what he was saying is, I am not going to go after the banks. I am not going to do anything big in terms of job creation. I'm not going to do anything about structural in unemployment. The economy, we're going to have uh, what we have now, the so-called uh, um, uh, jobless recovery, right? <laughs> um, so and what I'm, but we're, what we're going to what we're going to focus on is education. <clears throat> And we're going to pretend that education can drive economic reform. And I think that those of us who care about education have to say, education cannot drive economic reform. It doesn't matter how much money you put into education. Education cannot be a substitute for a jobs policy mm -hmm. that puts people back to work. And we have to say that. Education can democratize <clears throat> access to the existing jobs, but we can't create jobs. Mm -hmm. It's the government's responsibility to create jobs. So they blame the, their own economic failures, like producing cars that fell apart on, right. the, on the educational system. Yeah. When, for example, in just the automotive industry. In the 70s, we started to lose out to the Japanese and the Germans in the automotive industry. Where, uh, the policy was to create cars that fell apart in f four or five years. So naturally, and big, huge cars, but to blame those decisions on the, ed on the, on the schools right. is an outrage. Some people, listeners or viewers may be wondering, well, what about those test scores? Aren't we, um, aren't we fall in fact, behind other nations? And that uh, is something. My view on that is that... Um, I always thought kind of that the, the United States had a better approach in that we kind of let students go along a little slow, more slowly, and then our, our, our higher education, our colleges were the envy of the world, and they still are the envy of the world because we, we let kids develop a little more slowly, have some time for play and leisure, and then when they get to colleges, they start to blossom. That was then so that, but right now you, you got the thing where we, we're jamming uh, academics much too early into the, into the childhood, and we're driving, uh, using tests to drive the educational system. I, think, I, think it's a, I don't disagree, but I think it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that simple, because 
you know, we teach at City College, so I have, we have students from all over the world. And I just had this discussion in one of the classes, and the foreign-born students, the, the mm -hmm. less time they've been in the United States, the more adamant they are of what a terrible education they're getting here. In the college? In the, co in the college and those that went to high school also. Why? Because they're saying what they, what they were exposed to in school in their countries, they were treated with so much more respect mm -hmm. in terms of their intellect and their understanding. Mm -hmm. And they come and they find that they, they go to college and they're taking courses that they probably had when they were already in the equivalency of eighth or ninth grade. They also find, which I find really interesting, is that they don't think that the American students, their colleagues, know how to think critically. Uh -huh. They're simply going after what's the right answer well, on the they, test. Why are they all coming here then? Well, if it they, depends if, where they're coming from because some of them have been believe, or at least their parents believe, the myth of the streets paved with gold. And they come here for better opportunity. They, don't they come for colleges too? But in I, some respect. I, but I, then they're disillusioned because they see the reality. I'm going to cast this whole issue of the international comparison of the test scores in a different way. Um, you know, because the test scores themselves are, are really contested. Uh, about what they mean, who Absolutely. takes the test, yeah, that's what's a 12th issue, yeah. grader in yeah. China versus yeah, yeah. what's a 12th yeah. grader here, you know, uh, who are we selecting to take the test, there are all kinds of issues like that that, you know, that to me just throw the credibility of all these international comparisons, uh, that it challenges the credibility of all these international comparisons from the evidence that I've seen. When you pick up educational research journals, you see that the credibility of these international comparisons is is constantly challenged by researchers. So I, I'm going to recast it and what I want to talk about is the fact that our economy is producing jobs that require only a seventh or eighth grade education. Gene Anions has done this great research you know from the Grad Center about just using Department of Labor statistics that shows that the overwhelming majority of jobs that are being created in our economy now are for places like Walmart. Now given that, given that, the competition is for the 10 percent or 15 percent of jobs that are going to pay well and require mm -hmm. critical thinking and everybody else is going to be mm -hmm. competing for jobs at Walmart or Mickey D's or Chipotle Grill. So uh, or Rite Aid. So when you're competing for a job at Rite Aid, you don't need to know very much. So you're and I think that that's <laughs> what we need to... You're saying the real, if I understand it, the real purpose is to, is, is to dumb down the... Yes, the real purpose the, the is... The rhetoric is to complain about it, but the real purpose is to dumb totally. down... Totally. Totally dumb down the... Exactly. The, pop, the, the population, get them ready to work at Walmart The goal or McDonald's. is to synchronize the yeah. education system with the economy. And we have an sure. economy that is creating low-wage jobs requiring a 7th or 8th grade education, you can't have an educational system that's sending everybody to college. Well, Test-driven education, you, you create widgets, you know, standardized tests, standardized minds. And you don't and care no if they thinking. graduate. I mean, they can't think. There's no assessment of creativity or independent thinking. There's never been a, a test that measures the ability to think for oneself, let alone creativity, social capacity to think morally. Yeah. Uh, all these issues impact. And that's the reason that schools qualities. that serve mm -hmm. upper middle class, affluent they, they, communities, they, 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 they don't nurture. have a problem with the test scores, no, they do just, they? No, they so they're yeah. able to focus on material that encourages the, the kids thinking, yeah. to think critically. So they'll go to the elite schools. Mm -hmm. They'll yeah. go to the elite that's schools. That's interesting. And hardly anybody else is going to go to college which is the reason that tuition is being raised for, at <laughs> CUNY. You think it's an accident? This is the neoliberal project in the rest of the world. Impose higher fees for college, for higher education, to keep most people out so that only a narrow stratum of the population is going to go to college. So whenever we hear about these international test scores, I think we need to keep in mind that this is rhetoric that is used in this country to mask the reality of an increasingly stratified society that needs an increasingly stratified education system. Let me, wow. 
so round. I, I'm not sure how many more minutes we have left. I think we're, we're certainly in the last three or four. Um, so as we, um, as we bring this together, uh, I really need to know actually how many more minutes we have left. Um, so thank you. So we have a minute left. And um, so in this minute, is somebody, you got a story, you got a minute story. We, 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 I think, you know, we reached a crescendo, right? And uh, so uh, we're going to- Stay tuned. We're, we're straight to, we're going to tie up this conversation. We'll, we'll, we're give have an another irony. One. we'll give an irony back to you. Um, one of the things that's happening in CUNY, re reinforcing what happened in CUNY is a number of years ago, they set up this honors college. And the honors college is to take the best and the brightest and to bring them to CUNY and to give them no tuition, free computers, special courses, et cetera, within the realm of the public university. And those are the students that are coming from those backgrounds who otherwise would be attracted to go to the private colleges because that's their route into exactly that's what you're it. talking about. So that's the way we keep some of our um, honesty, as it were, in serving the needs of the city. It's, a, it's amazing. Huh, very interesting. Well, now I think we have, we actually have a minute. Remember, we probably have 50 seconds left. <laughs> uh, and uh, 50 little seconds. Um, and, uh, okay, so uh, again, we can be quick. I think the irony is, is that there are certain countries that however they're seen, and some of it is the testing, I think there is some validity to it. So if we take like Finland and Singapore and places like that that rank high, one of the things that's happening there is that they have some of the strongest teachers unions and some of the most flexibility in, in, in allowing for creative ways of teaching and are not locked into the things that we're locking more and more Finland, into. Finland, yes. Singapore, no. Finland, no, on, not. Uh, let, let's Interesting. Uh, Why? Yeah. We got, we oh, got, we got, we got, to we got to come back to this. I'm sorry, because, because, you know, time here. rushes on. So listen, we're, we're, we're going to come back to, we're, we're going to have, we're going to continue this discussion. We're going to, and, but it'll be aired a little bit later and you'll see it a little bit later. So, uh, uh, but it all goes on the website and we'll link to everything that everybody mentioned. I know they do this on Democracy Now! So it's.